They put me after the break, after Miranda talked, because boy, Ross and I were sitting there going, whoever's going to follow that amniotic fluid embolism uh, emotionality thing. I'm glad, but they also put me right before dessert, so I'm not a man to stand behind uh, or between somebody's sweets. So I'm gonna get started. Um, I'm gonna actually, if you don't mind, walk a little bit. I'm gonna come down here because I wanna make sure everybody on that side can see the slides. But we've got Craig's. <laughs> Let me get this. All right. Come on, let's load. There we go. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, preparing the patient uh, for transport and what happens. Uh, so far today, and hopefully you guys have all been getting uh, lots of good information, getting stimulated, uh, we've talked about the mechanisms for preterm labor. We've talked about some of the uh, conditions that can lead to preterm delivery, whether it's indicated or spontaneous. Um, we've talked about diagnoses for PROM. So let's talk about now what we do in the acute setting for the patient in preterm labor and threatened preterm birth, as well as why we do it. So let's start with a little vignette. And honestly, I had these grand designs to have audience participation and, you know, we're going to do a little family feud uh, audience response thing, but unfortunately that didn't work. So we're going to do old school and everybody raise hands, okay? And I know some people are a little bit uh, embarrassed to raise hands and show an opinion if you're wrong. Don't worry, nobody's wrong here. But we're going to kind of just go over this to kind of give everybody an idea of what, uh, uh, of, uh, what you think and, and why. So the vignette, uh, we have a 30-year-old G3P0202 who is now at 29 and 5. And it's a well-dated pregnancy. Okay, she presents to your five-bed L&D unit. So you guys are out. Uh, outside of the big city. She's visiting from the big city about two hours away by car, and she was previously admitted three weeks ago, given betamethasone and magnesium, and then sent home at that time with a negative fetal fibronectin. All right. The nurse calls you, the OBGYN provider, on call, and describes fetal heart tones with baselines in 150s, there's moderate variability, no D cells, but she's contracting every three minutes. All right. The nurse tells you her VAG exam shows her to be 690 and zero. And this is an experienced labor and delivery nurse. The bag of waters is intact but bulging, and she thinks the baby may be breached on exam. No bleeding or loss of fluid. All right? So you look at your resources. You have a neonatal nurse practitioner that is available by phone, but no neonatologist. You have one CRNA available in-house, but the uh, supervising anesthesiologist lives 20 minutes away. So to borrow from the movie Speed, what do you do? All right. So survey says, get her the heck out of there, transport, or transport the baby after the baby comes, or deliver because she's six centimeters dummy, and come what may, get your, your nurse practitioner there. What's everybody think? Who votes for A? Transporting a six centimeter patient. Oh, we have a smattering of hands. OK. Who votes for B? Transporting the baby. Even less a smattering. Ah, okay, we got a little more. Come on, guys. Come on. We're, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. Don't worry. <laughs> and who votes for C? Let's, uh, let's get the scalpel out. Deliver her now and then take what comes what, comes what may with your nurse practitioner there. Is that right? Okay. I don't see anybody. Everybody's responding yet, so we'll get into this. All right. Well, why transport? Okay. The answer actually it, it should be, hopefully after the end of today's talk, too, you'll realize Let's try to transport, all right? Um, when you transport, you're trying to provide patients, either mothers or the babies, with access to a proper level of care for an acute or chronic illness. So for example, when the patient presents at a site without proper obstetrical services, uh, the receiving site has requisite resources to treat the patient's disease processes and associated complications, so you're going to ship her off to someplace with a better level of care. It could be due to things such as compliance with an insurance requirement, so maybe not life or death you know, immediate acute situation, but uh, there's a financial issue. Or actually, you can even transport if the patient has a request uh, due to availability of resources or location of home and support, all right? Um, the goal, though, however, is it's better to get the baby within the maternal vessel to the place and deliver rather than to deliver the baby and then transport the baby. And there's actually a lot of good data about this sort of situation. 
Uh, one of the uh, seminal uh, articles came out was actually a Viennese study of neonatal outcomes between the mom and, and uh, baby in terms of transporting, and you comparing them to babies who were born actually at the institution that they received their postnatal care. And what they found was that there was a significantly higher, where's my pointer there? There we go. Significantly uh, greater mean neonatal intensive care unit stay and total length of stay, as well as uh, longer ventilator time and oxygen therapy exposure when babies were born at the outside hospital and then transferred over, all right? Overall, there was a significantly greater incidence of respiratory distress syndrome, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, intraventricular hemorrhage, uh, severe intraventricular hemorrhage, patent ductus, arteriosus, uh, patent ductus arteriosus, and mortality. Oh, sorry, that's, there we go. Th this, is, this is the Vietnamese stu study here. Sorry, there was a little bit of a, a forwarding there. But in, overall, though, this study both by Holig Schwandner in the Viennese study and the subsequent study that was done here in the U.S. at Christiana Medical Center in Delaware and looking at babies between 24 to 34 weeks, both of them showed that it's better to get the baby in the mom and delivered at the site where they get the postnatal care than to deliver the baby and then, and then uh, transport over. So let's, let's actually go back to uh, the next audience participation thing. So our, uh, our buddy Mtala, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, okay, started in 1986. It governs the transfer of unstable patients, all right? So the guidelines that require sending and receiving facilities are such that, A, the person needs to, uh, at the, at the uh, screening institution needs to screen all individuals who seek assistance at the emergency department. B, they need to transfer the patient to an appropriate level care facility per patient request, verbal or written. C, if a patient's unstable, they need to document the risk and benefit ratio for transport to a facility willing to accept the patient. Okay, D, um, they need to, um, when, when a, a higher level of care facility, when contacted, needs to actually accept that transport. All right? So E, the choice is all four of these are correct. F is three of these four, and G is two of these four. What do you folks think? This is actually pretty confusing, but this is something that is very important uh, as a transferring institution, as a receiving institution. Uh, does anybody vote for one of these? All four? All four? How about three or four? Or two or four? Okay. Actually, the answer is really two or four. So you have to screen all individuals who, who seek assistance at the ED. You do have to transfer the patient to an appropriate level of care facility, but it has to be by written patient request, not by verbal. So just because Mrs. Smith says, I don't like it here, you need to move me to you know, Hospital Z, unless she has a written request that, s that states this is what she's directing you to do, you can't do it. Um, the patient's unstable, of course, you need to document the risk and benefit. And then the higher level of care facility does not have to accept that transfer. They have to judge whether they have the facilities, they have the, the space, they have the resources available to take that patient. So just because you, you contact Hospital Y and say, hey, you need to take this patient off my hand, Hospital Y doesn't have to take that patient if they don't feel prepared or they don't have the space or the room or the resources. Okay, that's actually a, ver a really important point because this is going to speak to the idea of having to coordinate levels of care for your patient. All right. Um, of course, MTALA overall has pretty severe violations. Um, it can result in fines for hospitals and specific physicians who violate the MTALA uh, laws. Uh, for example, they can lose Medicare or Medicaid funding, and there are actually open legal action filed from the patients themselves for improper transport or, or not being treated. So in general, a pregnant woman who presents in active labor must be admitted and treated uh, at, the, at the institution through delivery unless an indication for transfer exists, i.e. going to a higher level of care. All right, so this is actually the hard part for those of us who practice uh, in outlying communities with uh, lower level care <laughs> hospitals or a lower level of resources, all right? Similarly, these are things that we need to be aware of for those of us who are on the accepting end and work at and have the privilege of working at <coughs> higher level care hospitals. When we talk about common indications, though, for transport in pregnancy, uh, the ones in red are the most common reasons, and of course, preterm labor and prom, premature rupture of membranes are there. 
also severe hypertension or hypertensive complications, and any exacerbations of medical complications that require additional services, for example, liver disease, diabetes, kidney disease, cardiac disease, et cetera. And also, of course, fetal abnormalities because of the presence of ancillary support services for the neonate. Other areas that are uh, also common reasons for transport include antepartum hemorrhage, maternal trauma, uh, growth restriction, or fear of indicated preterm delivery, and other borderline indications such as multiple gestation, malpresentation, or, or inadequate progress in labor. All of these due to, again, the presence of resources at your present institution. All right. Now the caveat though, and <clears throat> what I alluded to a little bit earlier, is that a major error occurs regarding maternal transport when providers and patients overestimate the ability of the present facility to provide an appropriate level of care. Thus, for those of us who practice, we need to actually have some sort of objective classification and knowledge about um, the level of care for institutions and assister institutions through which we might want to have contact or travel or, or, or uh, transfer to. In other words, there needs to be a clarification of the capabilities of the network, of the institutions in the network, and then there needs to be clear delineation of the responsibilities of all these institutions in this referral network. So let's talk about levels of care real quickly. And I know we're a little bit behind. I'm going to try to get us back on track. So I'm not going to go through all of these definitions, read them all to you. But suffice it to say, in terms of the neonatal levels of care, I think all of us are familiar with you know, your classic level one, level two, and level three NICUs. And there is actually a level four NICU designation. Uh, for example, here at Erlanger Health Systems, we just put in for our certification as a level four. Uh, specifically, we're talking about um, subspecialty care for kids with 24-hour availability of medical and surgical consultants for actually the, the more arcane and sophisticated uh, services such as cardiac bypass and ECMO. Now, how many of you are aware, though, that in addition to NICU levels of care, there are actually certifications or classifications for maternal levels of care? So some of you do. But to many of you, maybe this is kind of a new definition. Don't be surprised. This is actually a relatively recent um, enterprise that came out as a uh, uh, conjunctive effort between ACOG and the SMFM, and they just published these guidelines late last year. All right? So there are actually different level classifications for maternal levels of care, and the first level of care is the birth centers, where we're talking about peripartum care of low-risk women with uncomplicated singleton pregnancies and cephalic presentation. All right? Then you have your level ones, which are basic care, again, for uncomplicated pregnancies with the ability to detect and stabilize and manage unanticipated uh, problems, okay? These are areas where you can stabilize a patient initially and then you have to transfer to a higher level of care. Level two are specialty care hospitals, which are all the capabilities of level one, but they have appropriate high-risk uh, perinatal conditions uh, that can be uh, cared for by an OBGYN who's available at all times in-house and an MFM that's available by consultation. Doesn't necessarily need to be in person. Anesthesia services are also available for labor and surgical anesthesia. Level three is actually subspecialty care, which is level two, but now we're starting to be able to uh, incorporate complex medical uh, and obstetrical and fetal conditions with an OBGYN that's always available on site and an MFM director available at all times, though not necessarily on site. Okay, full-time anesthesia, and a full complement of subspecialists need to be present. And then the highest level of care for maternal uh, levels of care is actually level four, and this is the regional perinatal health care center, such as where we are at, at Erlanger, where again you have level three capabilities with now on-site medical and surgical care of the most complex perinatal issues, including ICU, and the ability to fac facilitate all transport and outreach activities for the region. So hopefully this kind of clarifies a little better in your mind about the hospitals around you and the ability uh, or the necessity to know what their abilities are in terms of temporizing and managing patients and where you need to actually ideally transport your patient who gets in trouble. All right. So next audience participation here. Okay, according to EMTALA rules, all right, A, the transferring hospital is responsible for the safety of the patient until that patient reaches the accepting hospital unless the receiving facility is the one who sends a transport team, okay? B, the accepting physician dictates how the patient is readied for transport. C, 
Transport services who supply the transporting personnel and equipment are responsible for the patient once they have performed their, all, their own on-site evaluation and taken the care from the referring hospital. Or D, all three, or E, two of these three. Who thinks one of these? Anybody? Nobody. How about all three of these? Okay, we have a few hands. How about two of these three? There we go, I think we got a little more hands. Actually, the only exception is that the accepting physician does not dictate how the patient's ready for transport. Ideally, the accepting physician should, be as, should serve as a consultant and give advice and say, you should do this, do this. However, the care for that patient at the, at the initial institution is that physician who's on site. So if you are at your level two hospital and a lady walks in in floored preterm labor, you're actually responsible for, for getting her stabilized and getting her ready. Okay, you're not necessarily uh, gonna have to reach a perinatologist that might take you, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour down the line and wait for them to tell you what to do. You are responsible in that setting, according to Amtala guidelines, to take care of that patient, all right? So what do we do then, all right? How do we prepare the patient for transport? Well, some of the key points are, number one, not all transports must be emergent, all right? However, when there is a severe maternal illness that's recognized beyond the ability of where you are, okay, you do need to refer promptly for the remainder of care and delivery, okay, not necessarily just for consultation. If there's any diagnosis of complications of the fetus, for example, malformations or conditions that require specialized care, such as cardiovascular stabilization or surgical procedures, uh, then you need to refer that patient out as well. All right. Now, how do we do a transport? And as somebody who's been doing this for going on 14 years, in Arizona, we were, my practice was actually the medical director for AIRVAC, which was the, uh, the uh, uh, medical ambulance service for the whole state. And here at Rock, we, we take a lot of transports and referrals from all of you folks, which we appreciate. Please note that, number one, the best thing really is a doctor-to-doctor -doctor consultation and not really being dependent on the nursing staff to relay and arrange for transport. And the reason is not that we want to disrespect nurses or their level of knowledge, not at all. In fact, many of you taught me or, ta or are teaching my residents and know more than some of us. However, the responsibility lies with the doctor, him or herself, and not the nursing staff. So a doctor-to-doctor -doctor consultation is actually best. All right? The transferring hospital needs to make sure that they obtain the patient consent and complete the physician documentation to fulfill all intolerant requirements. They need to make sure all records and studies are included with the patient and then they, they actually should determine who will arrange for the transport services, right? However, they can accept an offer from the receiving institution to take over. And at that point, then the responsibility lies on the receiving institution for the care of that patient. The receiving hospital on the other end needs to determine the level of care and bed availability. So sometimes, unfortunately, at Erlanger, we're, we're put on divert. And sometimes we have to send uh, to Park Ridge, for example, Sometimes Park Ridge and Erlanger are all full and we've had to send them out of state. But that is the responsibility of those of, uh, of, those of us on receiving end if we cannot take that person to find some place or, or give direction on, as to where to send that person. Um, they need to document all the transport details and request records, and then they need to ensure recommendations are made and clearly understood by the sending institution. Um, I learned this the hard way, actually, when I was a brand new attending in Phoenix. And just to give you um, one quick example, um, I got a transport of a woman off her Indian reservation six hours away. And at that place, they did not have beta-methasone. So I told them, okay, do you have dexamethasone in stock? Yes, we have dex. So I said, okay, give her six milligrams IV times one. They did not hear milligrams. They heard grams. So they gave her a thousand times the dose of dexamethasone that she should have gotten. Okay, luckily, you know, I had the, the state toxicology center on, on staff. You know, we brought her down, we observed her. She did really well, no adrenal failure, nothing going on with the baby. But that was actually a, a near miss that I learned quickly from. So that it is a responsibility as the receiving physician to make sure that, the, that your consultation, your advice is clear, but it's also a responsibility of the uh, sending institution to make sure that uh, we communicate and make sure that the orders are read back properly. That is why, again, physician to physician communication is key. Right? Um, 
<coughs> what to do for the preterm labor patient overall. So first, we need to determine the stability of the mother, of course. So per Amtala, that is the role of the physician or the designated qualified medical provider that is specified by the hospital. And this actually can be somebody who is not a physician, but for example, a nurse midwife or an advanced practice uh, uh, nurse or a, a physician assistant, as long as they carry the designation from that hospital that they are the ones responsible. If the patient is deemed unstable, okay, there must be documentation that benefits, uh, that, that talks about the transfer and that the benefits outweigh the risk of keeping the, the mother and the fetus there at the institution. So th this is, in other words, um, quantifying the risk and the importance of the transport. So in terms of what do we do for the mom, well, at the initial institution, the screening institution, all right, assess the mom. So make sure you obtain the vital signs and pertinent history, assess for vaginal bleeding or any evidence of severe um, pathology that is causing preterm labor, such as abruption, all right. Obtain a fetal fibronectin and then perform the cervical exam, as was mentioned by um, uh, Dr. O'Brien and uh, Dr. Fuentes, and then determine the fetal presentation. Obtain a GBS culture and start the GBS prophylaxis when, so, uh, when appropriate. Uh, screening urinalysis is always important to rule out underlying uh, uh, bacteremia, uh, your UTI, and I would also consider a UDS for somebody who presents in an acute setting. Um, assess whether the patient would benefit from a quick-acting tocolytic, um, especially as you are trying to stabilize her for a transport um, en route to the larger center. And in consideration for starting magnesium for neuroprophylaxis and tocolysis, as well as beta-methasone. And we're going to talk about these two points in a little bit more detail next, all right? Um, if there's a suspicion for PROM, as Dr. McQuivy pointed out, avoid the VAG exam and do a sterile spec exam to assess the cervical appearance. And I always talk to my residents about the positive thunk test. It's when you put in the, the speculum and you, hear, and you feel a thunk. You know, there's a head there or a butt. It's not a good sign. <laughs> you can verify PROM via st uh, sterile spec exam or if in your institution you do have point of care testing such as uh, with the um, immunization assays uh, such as with IGF-BP1 or PAMG1 testing, i.e. ROM Plus, Actin Prom, or AmniSure. Um, those are the best ones. You want to rule out concurrent core amniotis uh, through physical exam and clinical symptomatology. And then consider adjustments in your antibiotics for latency of gestation if there's PROM. Okay? Um, similar protocols are going to be followed for preterm labor as well as for PROM. The key thing is that we have two patients that we need to worry about transporting, not just one, correct? So we need to assess the fetus, and they, we need to ensure there's no evidence of hypoxia or, uh, or uteroplacental issues overall that would be cause for decreased uh, fetal reserve. In other words, we don't want the baby crashing in the helicopter in the ambulance en route. Um, and then we need to investigate whether there are any other underlying fetal malformations that will necessitate immediate neonatal intervention at the uh, receiving institution, such as a hydropic kid, okay? We need to make sure that we know what's going on so we can give an accurate report so the receiving institution can maximize the outcome for both mom and baby. All right, so one more survey here, all right? If we remember the case that we had, the 29-weeker in active preterm labor, is there a tocoly tocolytic intervention that would be most beneficial for the patient and the fetus? Oh, I'm glad they're, hey, look, at you guys all get stars. So we have indocin, we have terbutaline, we have mag, as a lot of people said, IV load and then infusion. We have a calcium channel blocker, or we can do a combination of these agents. What do you think? Anybody for, oh, I, I heard people say mag already, which I think is good, a good idea. How about indocin? How about terbutaline, nifedipine or calcium channel blocker, or a combination? Anybody combination? Okay, sure. I think, no, I think that's right. And actually, depending on the transport service that you deal with, you will get varying opinions as to what to use. But I can tell you that there's nothing more nerve-wracking for, for a transport nurse, no matter how experienced she is, to have an actively contracting patient that needs a 45-minute ambulance ride, a two-hour ambulance ride, a helicopter ride, a fixed-wing ride. They don't want that patient contracting. 
So it's not necessarily a shame to try to give a short-acting tocolytic to try to knock out or knock down active uterine activity in preparation for this transport. All right. So let's talk about, though, MAG, because a lot of you did whisper MAG, and I, I'm glad because that shows an awareness about the importance of magnesium and its benefits. And primarily, I'm going to talk about MAG not only just as a tocolytic, but really for its benefits for neuroprotection. And really, again, for those of you who are at the outlying institutions that need to send somebody, it's important to make sure that you get on the MAG train quickly to start to give these, these benefits uh, to the fetus. And in terms of magnesium for neuroprotection, there are multiple randomized placebo-controlled trials. The biggest in the U.S. was the BEAM trial that was done through the Maternal Fetal Medicine Unit uh, network. And how many of you guys uh, have heard about the BEAM trial? And Dwight Rouse, back at UAB, was the primary author. Right, so what they looked at was a 6-gram loading dose with a 2-gram per hour infusion for 12 hours. And what they found was that there was a lower rate of moderate to severe cerebral palsy in 28-week uh, gestational age infants or lower so these mid-trimester infants with MAG. And it was a relative risk of 55, 55%, so about a 45% reduction overall, with a confidence interval that did not pass unity. So there was significance there. Okay, there was the ACTOMAG study done by Crowther in the Australasian Collaborative Trial. This was published earlier in 2003. And in babies less than 30 weeks, uh, they were given a four gram load, then a one gram per hour infusion versus a placebo. And they found that the MAG group had lower mortality low rates of cerebral palsy, and a low rate of combined death or cerebral palsy as an outcome. And then lastly, there was a European study by Moret, uh, the pre-MAG study in France. They were looking at uh, a cohort of people less than 33 weeks who were given a four gram load of MAG only without an infusion actually. And again, they showed that MAG had a trend to protective effects against cerebral palsy or death. Now, the confidence interval did cross unity, so it wasn't truly significant, but there was a trend However, they did see a significant trend uh, or a significant finding of protection against severe motor dysfunction or death overall. So there definitely seems to be a benefit of onloading MAG uh, before birth, all right? Now, meta-analyses have been done as well, and there are three uh, good meta-analyses that are out in the literature. The Cochrane, good old Cochrane database is one. Uh, Maged Kostatine is uh, one of the big names in meta-analyses, and he published in OBGYN. 2009, and Crowther and, and their cohort uh, uh, of uh, colleagues did a similar publication in OBGYN in 09 as well. All these meta-analyses seem to look at the same five trials overall, which were the three that we talked about, the BEAM trial, the ACTOMAG, and the Moret trial in France. And then uh, they also looked at uh, Mittendorf's uh, study back in 2002 and the MAGPI trial which was actually more of a um, randomized controlled trial looking for benefits of magnesium and preeclampsia. However, what they did was they looked at it in relation to uh, risk of cerebral palsy uh, and death in these, uh, in these infants. And in trials specific for neuroprotection, again, all of these trials, when, the, when you look at specifically for neuroprotective effects, there was a significant reduction in death or cerebral palsy as the outcome, relative risk of uh, 85% confidence interval that didn't cross unity. Uh, it's a small effect, but it's still a positive effect overall. The overall absolute risk reduction for any cerebral palsy was about a 1.7% reduction from about 5.4% to 3.7%. However, for moderate or severe cerebral palsy, the protective effect was much more pronounced at about 0.64, or a 36% reduction. So it's figured that uh, out of these uh, meta-analyses, the number needed to treat to prevent one case of cerebral palsy was about 63 women for some form of magnesium sulfate. Okay. So the take home messages are the optimal dose and timing and duration of magnesium sulfate is not established. As you can see from the randomized placebo controlled trials that were out there, you have different levels of six gram load, a four gram load, an infusion for 12 hours, an infusion for 24 hours, no infusion whatsoever. We don't know, but mag, and the antecedent time period before delivery is valuable, all right? The data suggests overall the primary beneficial effect is in fetuses less than 32 weeks with the most significant benefits occurring for the younger babies. So the mid-trimester babies less than or equal to 28 weeks. So I think what we can come to a general uh, feeling about from looking at this evidence is that give at least a four gram loading dose if delivery is possible within the next 12 hours. Um, my group, 
in, in working with our residents at our center, we prefer a minimum of a 12-hour infusion for perceived maximum benefit, not necessarily uh, mag greater than 24 hours overall. Um, how about retreatment of mag? And I think uh, there were some questions about, well, if we if we given mag, do we need to give mag again? And this is a really great question because this is something that is not answered in the data. All right, the beam trial that uh, we talked about before, the MFMU trial, was the only one with a protocol for retreatment with a full dose if the initial infusion that was given was greater than six hours prior. So for example, if a lady came in, got magnesium, and then you know, seven hours later she started contracting again, it actually was something within the trial where they would uh, re redose with magnesium again. Okay? In my opinion, in looking at the data, <coughs> excuse me, the clearance of magnesium is dependent on the amount that you're giving, so the plasma concentration, and the patient's GFR, because as you may remember, mag is primarily excreted through the kidneys, some through breast milk, saliva, urine, but primarily through the kidneys. Um, and when we actually look, IV administration of magnesium for seizures has an immediate effect, and the effect lasts for about 30 minutes on average. IM administration leads to a delayed effect within 30 minutes, but an overall effect that only lasts for about three to four hours. All right, and then when we give magnesium for tocolysis and we turn it off, people start to feel better pretty quickly, right? And within six hours, they're up out of bed, moving around and feeling great. So in my opinion, the beneficial effects of mag really aren't staying systemic within the, within the mother and likely not systemic within the baby. You know, it gets cleared. So for me, I'm biased towards retreatment with mag. Now the question is, well, why is mag beneficial? That's actually a whole nother talk, quite honestly. Um, so I didn't put a slide in about it. I'm happy to talk to you about it um, afterwards. However, what I do believe is that the, the, the purported or suspected uh, uh, mechanisms for magnesium um, seem to be transient as well. They're talking about you know, stabilization of blood pressures, um, uh, inhibition of glutamate receptors and, and damage on nerves, those sorts of things. Anyway, um, nothing that I think points to or implies that there is a prolonged effect from a single dose of magnesium. So from my standpoint, and I'm freely admitting this, my bias is I retreat if it's greater than six hours. How about a cotocolytic? Um, indocin it seems to be something that is preferred in the literature out there. Uh, the reason why is that there's a theore theoretical risk that calcium channel blockers can potentiate the effects of the magnesium that you're giving for the fetal benefit. And what they can do is actually worsen hypocalcemia, worsen hypotension, and they can act synergistically with the mag to suppress muscular contractility and therefore cause respiratory depression. And uh, many of you uh, who've been around long enough used to know that terbutaline was pretty popular, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And then uh, recently, over the last five, five to 10 years, there's been concern about case reports that beta agonists increase the risk for pulmonary edema, hypokalemia, uh, definitely hyperglycemia, and in rare cases, myocardial infarction. Uh, so because of that, uh, turbulin has fallen out of disfavor as an immediate tocolytic. Um, initially, I'd ended my talk here because the steroid issue is, as we've intimated, a whole nother talk. But for those of you who may have uh, read the uh, abstracts from the Gray Journal and have seen some of the information that came out from the ALPS trial, antenatal late preterm steroid usage, I think that uh, the findings here are so... Um, uh, explodable and have uh, such potential to change our practice that I felt that we needed to talk about this. All right. First of all, as uh, was pointed out in earlier talks, beta-methazone and, well, steroids in general, um, beta-methazone, dexamethazone, have incon incontrovertible benefits to the baby. Okay. Antenatal cortical steroids don't increase the risk of maternal death, infection, or sepsis, and they do provide significant reduction in neonatal death, respiratory distress syndrome, intraventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis. In addition, subsequent studies have found that they actually reduce the need in the neonate for respiratory support, they reduce the need for ICU admission, and uh, reduce systemic infections within the neonate. The thing is that steroids have really been around since the original study of Ligon's Howie in 1972. And back then, they chose a conventional dose of beta-methazone, 12 milligrams, IM times two, 24 hours apart. And they were the genesis of all of these subsequent studies that have shown these neonatal benefits. All right. Um, what if you don't have beta-methazone, like in that Indian, uh, Indian reservation that I talked to you about? 
you can use dexamethasone, and you want sulfite-free dexamethasone, okay? Uh, because the sulfites that are there have actually uh, been shown to have potential toxic effects on the, on the, the fetus. Uh, but you can give six milligrams IV or IM every 12 hours times four. And something that I didn't actually realize, but I found in my literature search, is that in a pinch, you can use hydrocortisone, 500 milligrams IV, Q12, 12 hours times four. But keep in mind that um, the only two steroids that cross the placenta well and are resistant to the uh, placental enzymatic digestion by the hydrolases um, are dexamethasone and betamethasone. So really those are the preferred uh, uh, steroids to use. When do you give it? Okay, when do you give steroids? Well, whenever preterm delivery is expected within the following seven days for gestational ages between 24 to 34 weeks right now, according to ACOG, okay? The limits of viability have been pushed, quite honestly. And I'm fortunate enough to sit on the AAP's fetus, uh, Committee for the Fetus and Newborn, and we actually had a summit between the SMFM and the AAP about two years ago to talk about the limits of viability. And quite often right now, you'll see in these large level four NICU centers that we will do resuscitation for 23 weekers. So thus, I believe that there is um, support for giving steroids from 23 weeks of gestation on if full intervention is gonna be given. And this is per the newest iteration of the ACOG Management of Preterm Labor Practice Bulletin, okay? Um, give steroids if, threat, if preterm delivery is threatened unless delivery is impending, i.e. immediate, within the next one to two hours. And this is according to the Department of Health and Human Services Bulletin in 1994. Give steroids even if you can't get the full course in, okay? And in studies that have looked at uh, lung tissue, we've actually seen benefit within a few hours after the first dose of steroids. So even if you don't get two doses in or four doses in, give it anyway. There's gonna be some benefit overall. Other considerations. Well, what about the patient who presents at 22 and four, 22 and five, 22 and six? Is there a difference between 22 and six and 23 and 23 and one? Who knows? I think it depends on your institution, depends on the size of the baby, um, depends on the sex of the baby, depends on underlying comorbidities. But yes, there are uh, people and there are institutions that will resuscitate 22 plus weekers. So what, we're, what we think from a professional opinion is that for babies that are extremely premature, less than 23 weeks, there's unlikely any respiratory benefits. Physiologically, the lungs are just not developed. The al alveolar branches are just not there. But they may improve overall survival rates but remember, you're still dealing with a 22 plus week or a 23 week baby. So they still have a high risk of long-term impairment overall. What about greater than 34 weeks? How many of you are familiar with the ALPS trial that, that uh, results just came out? Okay, so the RCOG endorses the use of steroids at greater than 34 weeks for women with threatened preterm delivery, and they also endorse the use of it in C-sections for up to 38.6 weeks. And this is based on the Aztec trials, the antenatal steroids for term cesarean section trial by Suchfield and Associates in 2005. And basically what they found was that giving steroids basically um, for indicated or spontaneous uh, uh, delivery by C-section, those kiddos actually did better with a reduced rate of RDS and a reduced need for um, supplemental oxygen, reduced rates of transient tachypnea of the newborn. So based on that Aztec's trial, we did our own trial here in the US, the ALPS trial, or antenatal late preterm steroid trial through the MFMU. And that was a randomized double blind uh, controlled trial of a full course of beta methasone versus placebo, again, in babies who had indicated or spontaneous preterm delivery uh, between 34 weeks to 36 and six weeks. So we had uh, over 2,800 singleton pregnancies um, at 17 centers nationwide. And what we found was that the kiddos who, re who received betamethasone showed a significant reduction in the primary outcome of a composite respiratory morbidity uh, within 72 hours of life. So lesser amounts of need for CPAP or high flow nasal cannula, uh, lower um, levels of inspired uh, uh, fractionated oxygen, uh, lower rates of need for mechanical ventilation and lower rates of death. It also <laughs> reduced transit kidney of the newborn surfactant use there seemed to be no increase in choriamnitis or neonatal sepsis, uh, but a slight increase in neonatal hypoglycemia. 
And interestingly enough, within this population, 40% of these kiddos received only one dose of beta-methadone, and 65% of these kiddos were less than 36 weeks. So there's, there seemed to be a benefit in these babies, especially those 34-weekers, 35-weekers overall. This was the lead abstract in the SMFM that was just presented uh, two weeks ago. So the question that um, I think we as, as practicing community, and even to, uh, and to my practice especially, is what do we do about this? You know, should we be early adopters and start giving steroids to everybody? I personally don't think we're ready yet, and this is my own bias, because I'd like to see the data. I'd like to see the whole paper. All we have right now are results and, and a 15-minute abstract presentation. But certainly the results that are presented are tantalizing. And I think that there is definitely a path for consideration for steroids beyond 34 weeks right now. Um, last, last consideration, because I know I'm running a little bit over and I'm trying to catch this up. What about rescue doses of steroids? And for those of you who have been in practice for 20 years, when I was a resident 20 years ago, I got spanked if I forgot to give steroids every week to my patients in-house. And we kept patients in-house like 19 weeks with a circlage, quite honestly, in bed. So just to show you how far we've come, all right? The, the pendulum has swung back. And uh, the ACOG Practice Bulletin in 2016 endorses a single repeat course of antenatal steroids in women whose prior course was, uh, was administered greater than or equal to seven days previously and remain at preterm birth risk at less than 34 weeks. So basically, you can give a salvage course of betamethasone or dexamethasone, okay, but we're only recommending one. And the evidence behind it were three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials, two short reduction in RDS and increased respiratory compliance so the lungs were easier to, ven to ventilate, and this was the, um, the trial by McAvoy in 2010 and uh, the Greedy and, and Kurtzman, uh, Kurtzman paper that came out in 2009. A third study uh, by the, actually the pediatricians showed a trend towards an increased risk for RDS and a decrease in intact survival rates um, from giving this rescue dose of steroids. But these weren't the primary outcomes, though. These were secondary analyses overall. So, it's hard to say that there is definitive evidence that there is danger to it. Um, there is no large-scale support for repetitive dosing of steroid courses. So right now, we're recommending one additional course of steroids after the primary exposure. Um, what about transporting too late? You know, is it ever too late, the six centimeter patient, do we just keep her there, deliver her, and take care of the baby? Well, there's actually good data that's out there that it, it might seem that it's never too late, all right? And this paper comes out of uh, my former institution in Phoenix where we ran that AeroVac service. And um, there, there was a, in a retrospective review of over 1,000 OB transports for preterm labor, we saw that even with patients greater than seven centimeters in these 54 cases, with 25 of them fully dilated with stations between uh, minus two to plus two, um, none of these patients deliver on route. And 32 to 54 of these patients who were advanced dilated past seven delivered within uh, two hours of arrival. So what this, this doesn't mean that you should just go willy-nilly and, and transport everybody who's fully dilated. I think this is a, a cooperative venture, and we were successful because there was good communication between the primary institution, the receiving institution, and we had a reliable set of transport nurses who were experienced who could assess those patients and make the proper, um, the proper arrangements to get these patients expeditiously moved to a higher level of care. But if we have that sort of situation, if we have the right knowledge of the institutions and the, the specific responsibilities of the pract practitioners they're in, we can do a lot of good by moving these patients away. All right? So in conclusion overall, transport of the maternal preterm labor patient, number one, leads to significantly improved outcomes. So keep the baby in the mom and get the mom there if possible. It's vital to understand the roles of hospitals and regional care centers in choosing and knowing where to transport that patient. The provider at the point of care must be familiar with the resources of his or her own hospital and be honest, and if there's not sufficient resources, that provider is responsible for moving that patient to a site that has those resources to care, all right? Um, assessment of the, of the maternal and fetal condition is necessary and must be documented. Start the mag at the point of care especially if you're less than 32 weeks. Cotocolytics are allowable, but be aware of the poten potential for nifedipine or beta agonists such as TURB to uh, have side effects. Give the steroids, especially if you're between 24 to 34 weeks. 
And if there's good familiarity with the transport team, and the transport team is able to make confident and competent assessments of the patients, it seems to be never too late to move that patient away. Thank you.